Amen. And thank God. Saints, we are leaning into rest. We are about a month into um, the new year and halfway through uh, Black History Month. And we are praying that you are finding a new revelation of rest. That we are finding, uh, even as the news keeps giving us bad news and, you know, COVID is up and down, we never know what's happening from time to time. But we're hoping that you are finding a, a, a secret place with God, a place of rest that you can take solace, that you can lean into and step away from the systems of this world. And we're praying that this is your, your, what you're finding in our times together. Um, we, we have good news. If you're wondering when are we getting together again, are you wondering when are we getting together again? Anybody else want to get together again? Well, we are going to have some backyard services. Somebody say a backyard service. My God. We're going to have a backyard service first Sunday in March. And every first Sunday, as the Lord sees fit, we are going to have church right in our parking lot. Yes, right in our church parking lot. Don't forget to come out. We'll send you all the things. But at 10 a.m. first Sunday, we're meeting in our backyard, and we're going to have church. I hope you're there. All right, let's get into the Word. Let's get into the Word. Today, um, we're, cut, we're tapping into another aspect of rest. And I'm, I've taken, um, if y'all would humor me for a while, I'm, I'm going to just use some modern vernacular if y'all don't mind. And I'm going to dig into what the prophet is, Tay Money, has um, uh, tapped into our hearts and our souls. And the subject of, of my, my time and our talk today is that Jesus understood the assignment, my God. If you could just lean into your tap, touch your neighbor, type it in to the chat. Jesus understood the assignment. If you're wondering about all this wonderfulness, do y'all see all the wonderfulness behind us? We, man, I'm telling you, we, we, about, we about to do the thing the way, like, we out here. So here we go. The subject today is Jesus understood the assignment. And then you might be wondering, where is this coming from? Well, let's go to, we're going to Mark. This, our opening passage, is Mark 1, 35 through 37. It says, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he, Jesus, got up, went out, and made his way to a deserted place. And there he was praying. Simon and his companions searched for him. And when they found him, they said, everyone is looking for you. Jesus, everybody's looking for you. This is the text that we're going to ground our talk in today. And I don't know, have you ever felt like you were in a season like Jesus when everybody's looking for you? When you're, all, when you're, you're just busy. You booked and busy. You got stuff going on. Have you ever felt like you were just in demand and that everybody needs you, the kids need you, yeah, your partner needs you, the work needs you, yeah, you know, you got assignments due, you got projects due. Everybody's pulling on you. Anybody ever been pulled on before? Yeah, I got it. I still got our, our, um, our screen set up so I can see y'all. So I see you. Yes, Miss Mack and Queen Rochelle. Yes, this is what we've all felt like we've been in a season where everybody is looking for. I want you to put yourself in the shoes of our, uh, of our Savior. Jesus took some time to be alone, and here comes the disciples like, man, we set up this meet and greet, Jesus, and we got people waiting to see you. Um, everybody's looking for you. That pull, that demand, and I've come to remind you. This is just, I'm not going to be before you long. I just come to remind you that we have a Savior who can relate. Jesus can relate to our seasons in our lives where we feel pulled on, where we feel in demand. Like, we don't got enough to give to everybody, want a piece of you, and I just don't have enough to go around. It's never ending. My schedule is booked to the, the every, every hour on the hour is already taken up. If you've been in that season, I want you to know that we have a Savior who can relate. Jesus was pulled on a lot. And when we read the scriptures, we know we're kind of reading it from a, a modern context. But Jesus was famous. Do y'all get this? Like, this was before the internet. 
This was before social media. This was before TV and influencers. And the, but Jesus was low key. I would say Jesus was high key famous, right? Everywhere Jesus went, people were he- hearing, like, here's a guy who could do stuff for you. He could feed you, he could make you a lunch, he could heal you. You got skin disease, guys. But man, this the one. So can you imagine everywhere he went, he had the ancient paparazzi with him, no cameras, but just people vying for him, reaching for him. Hey, did you hear where there was times where he would try to get away on a boat and they would run and meet him on the other side. Jesus was famous. Jesus was what a lot of people in our modern day are reaching for reaching, striving for fame. We want to be known. We want our name out there. We want a brand. We want to, you know, we want people to book us, to recognize us, to get us, have our work out there. We need gigs. We need things. Jesus achieved what a lot of us in the Western world are striving for. You don't believe me? I got a verse to prove it. It's Luke 5, 15. Luke 5, 15, it says, but the news about him spread even more. <laughs> Large crowds would come together to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. Hmm, They wanted something from Jesus, to be healed of their sicknesses. Verse 16 is so important. It says, yet. Somebody say, yet. Somebody say, they said, yet. So, So they came to be healed of their sicknesses, yet he often withdrew to deserted places and prayed. Mm, just sit just sit in that verse. Jesus had just healed. All the people who are knowing his name is being known. Large crowds are coming to see him and to be healed. They want something from him. Yet, he withdrew often. He withdrew often. I read this wonderful article by a man named Dennis Pollock, and it gave a little insight to our time today. Um, what happens when you're in constant demand? What happens? All actions and activity can lead to burnout. Has anyone been there before? Have you ever felt burnout? (laughs) Have you ever been like, I have nothing else to give? Even among young people, we might suspect that anyone as busy as Jesus must surely have at least had some indications of burnout. After all, there were times when the crowds were so huge and so demanding that even his own mother came looking for him to take him home, to take her, her sensitive and, and deeply spiritual son to, to, to tuck him away. That um, She was fearing that he was, might be in danger of suffering nervous exhaustion and, and his incredibly hectic life and the needy crowds and the constant verbal attacks that he suffered from the Pharisees. Yeah, Jesus had the original haters. The original trolls, everywhere Jesus went, there was somebody that had a comment on what he had to say before the internet. Jesus, why are you healing on the Sabbath? Why are you eating that grain? Why are you talking to them ladies? Why are you going over here? Why are you eating dinner with them? The original trolls, Jesus had them, the original haters. Everywhere he went, people had something to say about what he was doing. Yet, as as it comes to burnout, with Jesus, it never happened. Check this. Never happened with Jesus. Jesus remained stable and emotionally healthy until the end of his short life. And we find the reasons he never suffered from burnout from the words in the, in the book of, of Luke. After Jesus healed the man with leprosy, this was, we just read this, um, that everywhere he went, the multitudes, they came to hear and be gathered and be healed of their infirmities. But Jesus, yet he withdrew often into the wilderness and pray. He often withdrew. Somebody said, we say withdraw. He withdrew. Wait, that's not correct English. He withdrew. <laughs> say he withdrew. Jesus constantly withdrew. This was a practice of Jesus. Now, let's consider the word withdraw. To withdraw in this context means to draw back and remove yourself from a present situation. Come on, we, it's preaching already. It implies that you are involved in some type of activity and you determine to cease that activity and involve yourself elsewhere. Feels like 
withdraw is like an intentional word, perhaps. Often it means removing, uh, removing from a higher level of action to an activity or a situation where there is no action at all. To withdraw. Come on, this is almost like a foreign word to us. What is this withdrawal? What does it mean? What language are we talking about? Because this is a practice that we hardly ever take time to practice. Even while in his early 30s and beginning a ministry that would last just three brief years, Jesus wisely recognized that he simply could not endure and succeed in his ministry if it was a constant, nonstop, never take a break effort. Could you sit in that for a minute? Three years that Jesus had. And so wisely, he, he realized I, 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 it's not sustainable unless I do something on my part. As much as there was for him to do, come on, I want you to, y'all tracking with me? As much as it was for him to do, as many of 10,000s as there were who wanted a, just a little bit of his time and his attention, as many sick people as there were throughout the land of Egypt, as great as a need as it was for the Israelites to be taught the ways of God, Jesus knew that he must take frequent breaks and withdraw from the massive crowds that constantly needed his attention. He withdrew and took breaks without apology. Come on here, Jesus. Jesus took breaks without apology. He didn't have to explain himself to anybody. The disciples were like, hey, where you at? We got a little thing going on. He never had to apologize for it. This is how Jesus sustained his success. With his incredible, think about this. Jesus had in, this incredible healing ministry. Think about what he had. We see, you know, we see people who you know, launch into healing ministries and do all the things, but Jesus had the authentic healing ministry. He could have held huge healing services, a big healing revival, a consecutive night for three years straight. This, was, this could have been his plan. I'm going to open it up. As popular as he was, he could have become a far bigger, a more personal personality in Israel had he done so and engaged with just a little promotion, as most ministers would have. Amen? So, you know, just think if Jesus had a modern publicist. They would have been like, Jesus, okay, we got a whole thing. We got, it's it's going to be a brand. It's a movement, Jesus. We're going to do a campaign right? Then we're going to do a tour. You're going to go a tour all throughout the ancient. It's going to be amazing. A book signing, Jesus. We're going to put out some books, have some people come, let them sign. We'll actually charge for autographs. So whenever people come, you do a healing, we'll have them, you can sign like their arm, whatever was healed, you can sign that. Commercials, I see it. Commercials everywhere throughout Jerusalem. We need more exposure, Jesus. It's your brand. Jesus merch. Wherever you go, we're selling sashes, sandals, tiles, handkerchiefs. It's a thing. We'll sell the hem of your garment. It will be a whole thing. Ticket sales, Jesus. So wherever we go, we're going to make a little revenue. We ain't got to worry about that tax money because we already have it. We're going to live large, Jesus. Just think of Jesus, if, we, if he had this modern day um, the way we want to sell and promote. Even his disciples tried to capitalize on his popularity. They all looking for you, Jesus. We all, we need to, we need to please the people. We need to get it going for the folks. But instead, he would heal some people and then disappear into the wilderness for a while. Come on. He would appear in public, do some teaching, perform some miracles, and then disappear again. Hmm. And sometimes he even told some of the people with the most dramatic healings, don't say nothing about it. Don't tell nobody. Go, just go home. Don't shh, shush, quiet. Isn't this amazing? It feels a little countercultural. <laughs> it feels a little is, what is it giving? Is giving not modern Western society? That's what it's giving. It's giving that to me. This is so, the, the narrative is so different from what we, we are trying to achieve in this modern world. Jesus withdrew often. Come on. 
Can you put that in the chat? Jesus withdrew often. This withdrawing was not just a one-time occurrence whenever he did something critical. No, Jesus withdrew regularly. This was as much part of his life, his ministry, his healing, his teachers, even the ministering, mentoring to his disciples. With all the crowds that constantly wanted his attention, he could not give himself to them 24-7 without frequently taking time to isolate himself and talk to the Heavenly Father. My God. Come on, I want y'all to think about this. Really sit and think about our Savior who is the greatest example of how we should live. You know, he didn't do like most people did and say, you know, do as I uh, say and not as I do. No, Jesus is actually showing us how to sustain, how to make it, how to really, what really success is. Because Jesus took time in his physical body, in the physical realm, to pull away and withdraw. In the physical realm where we live, Withdrawal is not only important, it's vital. Come on. Every time we go to bed, we withdraw. Think about this. When we lay our heads down on our pillows, close our eyes, and nod off into the unconscious state, we get no work done. We make no financial deals. We sign no contracts. We make no income. We are, from a work standpoint, entirely unproductive when we sleep. It seems like such a waste of time, right? Just laying down unconscious in the bed, eyes closed, mouth sometimes open, snoring, totally unaware of everything. And yet we are made to do such an activity for around eight hours of each 24-hour day. So do the math. About a third of our lives, we are accomplishing accomplishing exactly nothing. Hmm. So, well, that's not quite true. You're not a quite, we're not quite accomplishing nothing. The truth is we are accomplishing a great deal when we sleep. We are being refreshed. Our organs are being refreshed. Our glands are giving rest. We are being equipped for an effective uh, new day, for the new activity that's going to come our way. If we decided that we would be more productive and never sleep, it would not take long for us to realize the revelation (laughs) that we need sleep and that that sleep is doing great things for us. So anybody ever been on team no sleep? Grind all day, grind all night. We out here, give me, like, you're going to find out real soon. Your body, about day two, is going to shut down completely (laughs) because it's going to let you know how entirely necessary it is to get sleep for productive living. Assuming that sleep is unproductive is an absolute folly. It is one of the most productive activities we will ever engage in. Come on. Even though our world, with, it, it makes us really expose the lie of the enemy, the lie that the enemy has told us, that if we are grinding all day, grinding all night, team no sleep, got to work, can't stop, won't stop, that this is actually the way to prosper. And Jesus' life is telling us just the opposite because Jesus took time to intentionally, physically withdraw. So there are six reasons, and then I'm out your way. You could go have brunch, go enjoy your, the rest of your day. Six reasons Jesus chose solitude. If you're taking notes, I would, uh, would love for you to write down these scriptures. Use it in your times with God this week. Use it in your own Bible study at, alone at home. So there's Jesus, six reasons why Jesus chose solitude. The first one was to prepare for a major task. I want you to think about this in your own life. When you have something major coming up. After Jesus was baptized, he spent 40 days in the wilderness praying. And then after this, he was tempted by Satan and began his public ministry. That was the first reason why Jesus chose solitude over people, over business. The second reason is to recharge after hard work. Come on here, Jesus. In Mark 6, 30. In 32, Jesus sent the disciples out to do ministry, 
And when they returned, he encouraged them to separate from the people who were following them and just to rest, right, to recharge. Another reason, to work through grief, to work through the grief. After Jesus learned that his cousin John the Baptist had been beheaded, he went away by himself. Yes, even the Son of God grieves. And a lot of times we go through, we go through grief. We go through hardship. And this is such a great example of we got to withdraw. You don't need to be strong and shouldered on and keep on and you still showing up at work and, oh, my gosh, we wear it as a badge of honor. You're so strong. No, go sit down somewhere. Let God recharge you. Number four, before Jesus often withdrew solitary places before making an important decision. This is found in Luke 6. Early in his ministry, Jesus spent the whole night alone in, in prayer, and then the next day he chose his 12 disciples. Amen. The next one, in times of distress, this is what Jesus did. Hours before Jesus was arrested, he went to the Mount of Olives and, went, and he went on a short distance away from his disciples to pray. He was in a great emotional agony knowing what he was about to face. So he took some time to get along with God. And then the last reason why Jesus took some time and he chose solitary, and so he chose solitude over people, things, business, calendars. It's just because he wanted to focus on prayer. This is Luke 5, 16. Many times in Jesus' ministry, he spent time alone in prayer. This is why Jesus understood the assignment. This is exactly why. In order to complete his mission, God's plan, God's purpose for him on the earth. He needed to withdraw. He needed to spend intentional time alone with God. The greater demand that was on him, the more Jesus and his humanity depended on God. He understood the assignment. Jesus' time with God was more a little different than what we do. We love prayer on the run. I'm, all, I'm here for it. I'm not condemning anybody, but that's usually our practice. Pray on the run. I'm in the car. I'm talking to God. I'm also yelling at people, but it's okay. I'm talking to God. I'm in the shower. I'm doing things. I'm getting ready. I'm going on the walk. I'm on the treadmill. Prayer on the run is good. The Bible does tell us to pray without ceasing. I'm not mad at it, but there are some times where we have to take some intentional time to be alone with God, to have some time just with you and God. And then when I already feel, I already feel the angst, I already feel it already because people was like, okay, I tried that, but what if I fall asleep? Like, or I like to spend my time with God in the bed and then I talk to God and then it, I just kind of end up falling asleep. Anybody else been in sleep, sleep ministries? Okay, yeah. Um, but you know what? I love what Jesus did. Jesus got up and he intentionally went somewhere, not just stay in the bed and pray. Like he went somewhere. And then even in your, in your time with God, and you might feel bad for like, man, I, every time I feel, have some time alone, I fall asleep. I want to ask you, I want to ask you, what parent is ever mad when their child comes into their lap and just has some time to be with them, and if that child falls asleep in their parents' lap, what, what parent is mad at that? That is the most precious time. If you are having some time with God alone and you fall asleep, you have just fallen asleep into the bosom of your parent that you love so much. It's still quality time. And a lot of us in our, uh, in our rapid world, if we're honest, we are uncomfortable with silence. Anybody else like that? I would spend time with God, but I don't know what to say. And then I'm just sitting here. And then all kind of thoughts come into my mind. We are so uncomfortable with silence because this world has done a great job of filling up every moment of our day. It's always a radio. It's always a song. It's always YouTube. It's always social media. We fill our time and our day with so much 
and God is like, I just need a little time with you. Just take five minutes. Take ten minutes. When you're in your car, don't turn on a radio. Just have some time of silence. Some of us are so uncomfortable with that. Have you ever sat in your house and you don't turn on the TV? It's like, oh, man, I don't know what to do. I need background noise, right? This is the times that God is like, I, I would love to be with you. I would love to just have some time for you to sit and be still. If you don't know what to say, grab your favorite verse. We have Google now. If whatever you're going through in your life, Google it. Get a verse for peace. I need a verse for heartache. I need a verse for um, more love. I need it like get that verse and just think about it. Meditate on it. That whole time with, when you're with God, just sit, withdraw, take some time to be along with God. Withdrawing from the crowds in your life is take, and, and taking time to rest is actually an act of resistance. We've already learned that the world has taken Jesus' very example and perverted it and made it countercultural. Everything that Jesus achieved in his short life, three years, Jesus saved, literally saved the world in three years. We are standing here today believing in the word of God because of three years that Jesus took and he maximized his time. What would happen if we use rest as an act of resistance against this capitalistic society, against this society that says that you're nothing unless you're working. You're not any help into the company unless you're doing overtime. You're not, what if we use rest as resistance? What if we use rest as reparations? What if we were to be like, no, our ancestors never got a chance to rest. Think about it. Never got a chance to take a break. Never knew what it was like to, take down, to sit down and take a nap. Always on call. Even if you had a day off, if master called you, you was back on the job. This is our way of taking reparations for our ancestors and saying, like, no, I will not be another cog in the wheel of this society system. No, I will take time and rest. Because when you take time and rest, you're using rest as worship. Come on. Rest as worship. Rest is saying, you know what? While I'm resting, God is working. I don't have to do it all. I don't have to fill my schedule. I don't have to keep going, keep working, keep grinding. When I take a rest, God's going to do the rest. Amen? When I take a rest, God's going to work it all out for my good because I'm stopping because rest requires trust. If I take my hands off of it, I believe that God's going to fill in all the gaps. Amen? This is what God's It's like the principle of tithing. When you tithe, you're saying, God, I'm giving you this 10%, and I believe that you're going to sustain me with the 90. You're going to continue to help me to live and give me everything I need and sustain me with the 90. It's the same thing with rest in our life. Will you give God just a portion of your time and believe that God's going to fill in the gaps? God's going to do it. God's going to meet every need. God's going to fill your schedule. God's going to help you with the project. God's going to give you the wisdom that you need to bring your, your business for it. God will do it if you take time to withdraw and to rest and to be alone with God, to hear the assignment, to hear God's heart for you. A lot of us are going 100 miles an hour in the wrong direction when all we need to know is to have time to hear God's voice for clarity. So there's just a, quick, a few questions I want to ask you as we wrap up. Some questions to take. It's your to-go plate. Take these questions as your to-go plate. Eat on it during the week, all right? Question number one. Jesus needed some time to be alone with God. Put on your Holy Ghost imagination. What do you think Jesus prayed for? What do you think Jesus prayed about? When he was alone, if you are literally the son of God, you are God. God took time to have some moments. Like, who are we? Who do we think we are? What do you think Jesus prayed about do you think he was like, these, look, these people are on my nerves, Lord. I'm going to need more. I'm going to need more. More of your love, more of your joy. These, I don't know, these disciples. Who did you, why did we pick them? I don't know. Jesus was probably not like me in my imagination. But what do you think Jesus talked about with God? Number two, do you find it hard to spend time in solitude? Is this your struggle? Is this where you are 
um, trying to wrestle with, like, why can't I be still? Why can't I be alone with my thoughts? What am I thinking about? Why is this hard to do? Spend some time reflecting, like, why can't I be still? What am I compensating for? Why can't I, why don't I want to be with myself? What am I trying to block out? What am I not trying to remember? What am I not trying to, to, for it to bring up? And let God minister to you right there in that place. And lastly, what should worshiping God with your rest look like in this current season? Where can you say, I've done all I can do in this day? And I'm going to stop. <laughs> and I'm going to let God do the rest. I'm, you know, I'm not taking another meeting. Matter of fact, I'm going to take the whole afternoon off. I'm going to not think about work. I'm going to put up my laptop. And as I'm doing it, I'm saying, God, I believe and I trust you. You're going you're gonna to do the rest. Amen. Let's just close in a word of prayer. I'm just really praying that God will continue to minister to us what it means like to lean into rest this year. God is not getting the glory out of your life for you being burnt out and tired and, you know, snapping at everybody. That ain't, that ain't, that ain't it. That's not where God is having us in this season. So, Lord, bless your word in our hearts. Jesus, we adore you. We worship you. Thank you for such an amazing example of who you are. Thank you for showing us. <laughs> you knew that this 2022 world system would be in existence and we would need an example. We would need to see what it looks like to take a moment to stop, to rest, to withdraw to not strive and seek fame, to not go for 24-7 um, and nonstop having people pull on us and, and, and use it as a badge of honor to be busy. No, God, you want us whole. You want us healed. You want us resting in your presence. So, Lord, teach us. Let this word resonate in our hearts as we go throughout our week. God, we need you. We need you like never before teach us give us wisdom for those who don't know who Jesus is in this moment we always want to offer salvation to you if you've never had a chance to encounter this Jesus if you've only been to church stuff and you've never really taken a moment to be like now this is this is the Jesus I could get with I don't know about the other Jesus they've been talking about but this is the Jesus I want to follow I want to give you an opportunity to follow Jesus in this moment if that's you and you're like, hey, I, I want to follow Jesus. Would you just repeat this prayer after me and say, dear Jesus, thank you. Thank you for such a good example. Thank you for, for dying for me, for rising for me. I believe in you. So, Lord, I open my heart to you. I confess that you are Lord, and I want to follow you. Teach me, God, how to follow you all the days of my life. This is just one prayer to start the journey of my relationship with you. So, Lord, help me to get plugged into community and know more about you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, I love you, people of the way. Thank you, friends and family who joined us. Um, I look forward to seeing you first Sunday in March, but we'll see you again virtually next Sunday. All right? God bless you. Go out and show people the way.